Normal place of coming out is the ankle, the bottom of the foot, or between the toes. And as she moves down, she produces enzymes that turn off the immune system that are anti-inflammatory. And as she migrates and she moves about a half an inch a day, as she moves down, your, bo your body reacts with throbbing and aching and fever at the side of her head as she moves down. And so what people do is, as it gets more and more throbbing, as it gets closer to the bottom of the foot, they go and they soak their leg or foot in cool river water. And the moment the skin falls just a few degrees temperature, she pops out half in and half out of you and releases eggs into the water. So what causes the problem? Well, when she pops out of you and releases the egg, she dies immediately a yard of worm, half in you and half out of you, that begins rotting. So she can cause all kinds of secondary infections and blood poisoning. Uh, the time of year that she comes out of the bottom of the foot is the time that people are needed for harvesting the crops. So you can have an entire village where 30 to 40 percent of the people are incapacitated because their feet are up in the air healing from these worms popping out. Now what do you do for treatment? Well once you get the big worm you cut with a razor blade just in front of the head and you roll her up on something about the size of a matchstick but remember she's the consistency of cooked spaghetti. So if you pull too much and you roll more than about a half an inch, it will break and rot inside you and cause horrible scarring, sloughing off, secondary infection, and uh, blood poisoning. So it is a tremendously debilitating disease and we've almost wiped it off the earth. It will probably be the third disease wiped off the earth. The first was smallpox, the second will probably be polio, we're hoping. We thought polio would be wiped out by the year 2000, but because of September 11th, uh, we can't get everyone to get vaccinated now. But this disease may be the third disease, and it's, remember how they say one person can't change the world? Two people can. Jimmy and Rosalind Carter. Uh, lots of people make fun of the Carters, said that he was a failure as a president, that he, his, when he's asked about it, he said, you know, my choice was when the Iranians took the hostages during their revolution, the American hostages, sure, I could have dropped the nuke on them, or I could have come in there and uh, dropped troops and started a war, but my idea of being president was to apply Christian principles and killing a lot of people is not Christian. Compromise and working together for the good of both is a Christian idea. And this is why I think he's one of the greatest Americans ever because he doesn't really talk about his religion and rub it in everybody's face. He just lives it. And when you see something, somebody that something in their life, their own beliefs, change the world and change them for better, then you probably want to do something like that. He did Habitat for Humanity. Who knows what that is? That's right. They go all over the world, in the United States and everywhere in the world, and they build free houses for the poor and give them to them. He goes wherever there's a civil war and tries to negotiate between the two parties. Whenever a new country is formed, he sends in observers to make sure that the vote is free and fair. Uh, the Carter Foundation has done amazing things throughout the world, and yet they don't bang their drum. They just do it because it's the right thing to do. Now, here's what happened. Their last trip abroad, they went to West Africa, and they saw this, and they freaked out. I think especially Roswell. And she's a tough old thing, but they freaked. And they came back and they started asking questions about what they could do about it because it is a very obviously gross disease. And they got some really good scientific advice 
and they did something very simple. First thing they did was they contacted National Geographic and they had them map every village in West Africa that had this outbreak, and it's only in West Africa. Every village was mapped on a map knowing exactly the location of villages that were infected with this worm. Then he went and got corporate sponsors and drilled a clean, fresh water well in every village. Then he went to Legs Corporation. Anybody ever heard of them? Back when they first came out with pantyhose, they used to have these little plastic eggs with pantyhose in them. And that's a Georgia corporation. And he went to them and got them to donate hundreds and thousands of meters of pantyhose. And they cut them into one foot squares and mounted them on one foot square wooden uh, frames and gave them to hundreds to every village and told the villagers, when you're awake from the freshwater well that we've drift, done for you, and you have to drink water from a river, pour it through the pantyhose and then drink the water, it will keep the copepods from going through. Then. If you're in the village and your foot is aching and throbbing, draw fresh water into a pan, stick your feet in there, and boil the water afterward. And they have wiped this out from 1,800 villages to 13. 13, only 13 exist in the world now that have this parasite. So this is purely people caring enough to do something about it. And what they did was, I mean, yeah, it was expensive, but it wasn't that hard. So, the guinea worm is a great success. All right, so anyone have questions about the guinea worm? Why? What's up with the last 13? Uh, just those were ones that were in, you know, this constant civil war and all these areas where there's conflict. Just systemic problems. Yeah. All right, the next one is, uh, remember what's this class about? You. Me. Okay, so I grew up in South America, and there is a gazillion of what we call non-segmented flatworm diseases. It's in Central America, Caribbean, South America. It, you can see around the world the fluke diseases. Look at this. We're talking about liver flukes bladder flukes, kidney flukes, intestinal flukes. They're all non-segmented flatworms. We're only going to talk about the liver fluke because that's the one that I had to grow up with and it's a good example of all the rest. Uh, by the way, this is the first of our parasitic diseases that can cause cancer. One of the test questions is how many of these parasitic, parasitic diseases can cause cancer? This is one of two. Uh, it is in the United States in the fact that it is in the Puerto Rico. Um, all right, so fluke disease, by the way, what segmented flatworm? Everyone's seen a segmented flatworm. Yeah, they have flatworms. Tapeworms, those that are crawling out your cat or dog's butt. Yeah, those are segmented flatworms. These are non-segmented flatworms. All right, so let's talk a little bit about it. Uh, First of all, the scientific name is schistosomiasis or schistosomiasis. And it used to be called Bilharzia because the man who discovered it, that was his last name. So remember, you will hear it referred to as flukes, schistosomiasis, big belly is a common name, and then also Bilharzia. Um, it is bladder, kidney, intestinal, and liver flukes. Uh, we're going to concentrate on the liver fluke. Uh, the, well, let me just go through the life cycle of it. So, you have these flukes and the eggs from them come out, either your urine or your poo or both. And when you poo them out, uh, they get into the water and they uh, the eggs hatch and become what we call cercaria. And these, uh, let's see, I'm just thinking, eggs hatch and make mirror cercaria, sorry. 
The eggs hatch as soon as they hit the water and they become myrosicaria and they move to a uh, freshwater snail and fuse and have asexual reproduction in the um, freshwater snail. Now, when the cercaria are released from the freshwater snail, they look like this. They have a head and then they have a long body and then they have a T-shaped tail. And you can actually almost see them. They're right at the edge of being visible. But when the snail is releasing them, the water turns milky because there's so many tens of thousands being released. So the water will actually turn cloudy because there's so many of them. If you walk through this contaminated water, these little uh, Mirosicaria have an enzyme at the head and they will dissolve themselves, dissolve through your, oops, I get the two terms through. The one where the eggs hatch is the Mirosicaria and the one that has the head that dissolves into your skin is the Cercaria. And that's the Cercaria, right? Right. So anyway, what happens is the enzymes drill into your skin and you will get a dot, a tiny little dot sort of like a, a pinprick dot and it will ex it will eject its tail and it will migrate to whichever blood vessel it infects for instance for the liver fluke it's the hepatic portal vein and it lives in the hepatic portal vein it enlarges to be about three inches long and the male is about an inch long and they lay there permanently eating and having sex for 5, 10, 15 years um, the female produces hundreds of little hairy eggs and these little hairy eggs exude enzymes that allow them to sort of melt through all of your tissues and end up in the bladder or the intestines. And as they melt through your tissues, the eggs cause the inflammation that gives it the characteristic name Big Belly. You can see this person here with the Big Belly. They don't have big belly because they're eating. They have big belly because of the inflammation of these eggs migrating through their tissues. So the asexual host is a freshwater snail. The sexual host, again, is man. The most dangerous form of the disease is the eggs. The eggs, as they migrate through, is what causes this inflammation and once you get the big belly, there's nothing to do about it. Now, there's good news. A blood test will find it, and a two-week uh, antiparasitic will get rid of it. But if you walk through the water again, you get it again. And this is where they have drilled in. You can see these tiny little spots, but you would not even notice it. So when I was growing up in Brazil, we used to go to the movies, and we would freak out when we'd see American movies with Americans water skiing on lakes. Because every day, on the radio and on the television and in school, we would be bombarded with, if you're a decent educated person, you don't go swimming except in a public swimming pool or at the beach. No one is supposed to go in streams or rivers or ponds or lakes. If you do, you're going to get big belly and you're going to die. And so we were just, it's all, it's in your head every moment of every day. And they thought education would solve the problem. Will it? No. no. Everybody in the United States knows how you can get HIV, but people get it every day. Education doesn't solve the problem. Particularly where I'm from, uh, remember down in the south is where I grew up, but when I, an adult, I bought a place up here in the north where it still exists. Brazil is the opposite of here. The south is the industrialized center and the north is poor and, uh, you know, not very industrialized. So in the south where they have sewage treatment, there is no problem. Because if people don't poo into the rivers and there's no urine or poo getting into the rivers, no eggs get in there and the snails don't get infected. Uh, we tried killing snails, molluscicides. Guess what? Snails are kind of like fleas. You can kill 100,000 of them, and if they leave two, they're back the next day. 
So molluscicides have not worked because they have this huge biotic potential for reproduction. So uh, Brazil has developed a phase three, it's in phase three trials, a vaccine for this microbe, this parasite. And we're hoping that education plus sewage treatment plus blood testing and treatment will get rid of it and the vaccine. Now, how does it hide from the immune system? A unique way. This one hides by camouflage. It coats itself with your blood serum. It takes your blood serum proteins and coats itself. And depending on the variety, it can do it as quick as 30 minutes or it can take up to 48 hours. So once it gets into the blood, it immediately starts coating itself like painting itself red in a red room. So your body doesn't see it. The immune system doesn't see it. Uh, what else did I want to tell you about it? Uh, oh, well I went on a one of those little things where you, you know, you're in school and you can go on an internship project. So I went on an internship project on education on schistosomiasis in northern Brazil. And we get up there and it's just like river blindness. In northern Brazil, it's illogical but it's true. They have these huge rivers that come from the Amazon but there is no rain along the coast. So it's extremely dry carrying a big river and that's the only source of water till you get to the coast. So all the villages have to depend on one river or two. And that means you've got to take your bath, you've got to get your water for drinking, you've got to get the water for cooking, you've got to get the water for washing yourself and washing your clothes all from the same source. Now, so we were there and we were trying to educate the local population. We we're doing blood tests of all the kids and treating everybody that was positive and everybody was positive. And we asked them questions and they said, yeah, we know about it. And there was this lady right next to where we were doing an education program with kids and she was washing her clothes in the river this deep, ankle deep in water. And we said, do you know about schistosomiasis? And she said, yes. She said, do you know about the snail? She reached down and picked one up and shoved it in our face and said, yeah, here it is. <laughs> and we said, did you know it, it will drill in, the little parasite will drill into you while you're standing in the water? And she said, yeah. We said, well, why are you doing it? She says, how am I going to wash my clothes? How am I going to wash my kid? And when it's 110 degrees, how are we going to cool off? We don't have electricity. We don't have ice. We go swimming. We live with it. So that's why there has to be education, sewage treatment, and a vaccine, as well as regular blood testing and treatment, because all it takes once they cure it is to walk through the water one time. So it's a per tremendously bad illness, but there is progress on it. Just not look at how much of the world is infected. So it is sad. Uh, any questions about this one? Okay, the next one is the killing disease of mankind. Africa has everything. Huh? Africa has everything. <laughs> everything. And Asia. Sorry, to skip Africa. Back. Look at India. India's had everything we've been talking about. Sorry, to skip back. It's protein itself with blood. Can it coat itself with? Yes. It coats itself with your own blood serum proteins. All right, so this is plasmodial disease. And there are hundreds of different varieties. We're going to talk about the worst one called Plasmodium falciparum, and it means malignant relapsing malaria. And uh, remember the word malaria is Latin for bad air because they, set, they recognize that people that live near swamps where the stinky air got the disease, they thought it was the bad air. They didn't know it was the mosquitoes. Only one kind of mosquito, the Anopheles, and remember it's only the female that bites. Um, carries this, and this one is opposite of all the other ones we've studied. The sex happens in the mosquito, and the asexual happens in man. So these are the countries in the world that have malaria endemic, meaning there are constantly outbreaks of malaria. Notice that we used to be in this, but during right after World War II, 
Uh, we sprayed till we just about killed everything and everybody. And uh, we got rid of the Anopheles, but it's back. Anopheles is all in the southern United States, but the parasite isn't in the mosquito yet. Uh, I remember when I was growing up in Alabama, uh, in like third and fourth grade, every day at six o'clock, the DDD truck would come by and it would put out these huge clouds of DDT behind it and drive down everybody's street because we had mosquitoes the size of Volkswagens. And we would play in the fog behind the truck, ride our bicycles and try to keep up with the truck. And now DDT is considered toxic and we don't know what it does to people. And I'm just thinking, I wonder how much of my body fat has that in it. You know, every day for years I played behind the DDT truck for hours. Is it like when the ice cream truck came and everyone got excited? Yeah, everybody got their bicycles and raced in and out of the fog behind the truck. This is crazy. Mm -hmm. All right, so anyway, uh, let's talk about the life cycle. It's really complicated, so listen carefully. When, and remember, the Nopolis mosquito only bites sun up and sun down during the day. She hides under your bed or in the eaves of, and sits there and digests. So when they bite you, and by the way, they love women more than men, and the sweatier you are, the better. Uh, it attracts, and people that are most susceptible at, are, have a pheromone that they give off that the mosquito is attracted to. So it's really kind of twisted, this disease. It still kills millions. It's the greatest killing disease of all kind time because before 1945 it killed over 10 million a year for 5,000 years. So it is the greatest killing disease of mankind and we're kind of hopeless with it because every time we come up with one treatment we haven't applied it consistently and effectively and the mosquito has mutated. Well not the mosquito but the parasite mutated around it. So in Thailand right now they have straight Thailand, Cambodia, and Laos. They have strains of malaria for which there is nothing to treat it. Nothing at all. <clears throat> so anyway, the mosquito uh, injects the infective stage when it bites. Remember when the mosquito bites, it injects an enzyme that keeps your blood from clotting. And in the saliva, it injects these sporozoites called the infective stage. And the sporozoites circulate in the blood and go to the liver in 30 minutes. And once they fuse with the liver cells, they're hidden from the immune system. So if we ever do develop a vaccine, and we will, because why do we think, does anybody know why we believe there can be a vaccine for malaria? Because children get it, get over it, and are immune to it for life about 20% of it. Adults get it and they have it relapsing forever. But some children get it and get completely over it and are immune to it. So if there is a natural immunity, we must be able to do find some way to stimulate it. But anyway, the sporozoite fuses with liver cells and inside liver cells it goes through an asexual reproductive process and explodes those liver cells into the blood releasing the second stage called the disease stage called merozoites. And the interesting thing about merozoites are they're sticky like super glue. They stick together in clumps. And if you're asked what's the disease process, and you will be, there are two ways it causes disease. Merozoites infect red blood cells and reproduce inside them again and explode them causing anemia and fever. But the big way it kills you is the cap, it sticks together and blocks capillaries, shutting down one organ at the time. So it shuts down your major organs by blocking the blood feed of the capillaries. That's merozoites sticking together. It also causes disease, anemia, by exploding your red blood cells. Some of the merozoites, and again, we don't know how or why, mature to become gametocytes that are picked up by the biting mosquito. The gametocytes fuse and make sporozoites in the mosquito. So the sexual reproductive stage is the mosquito. The asexual, where 
sporozoites make merozoites, and merozoites evolve into gametocytes is in man. The worst stage is the merozoite. How does it hide from the immune system? Within liver cells in 30 minutes. Okay, let's talk about treatment. Uh, treatment has been, well, once we tried to get rid of the mosquito vector and we caused great ecological damage and almost wiped out several different kinds of birds so they no longer spray for, with 2,4-D or 2,4-5-T. Plus, they uh, became immune to it anyway. The good thing about 2,4-D was you could spray a house once a year. Remember, I said it doesn't break down in the environment. So, that's a good and a bad thing about it. Um, we had the oldest treatment for it is, uh, anybody know what the oldest treatment for it is? Quinine. Quinine. And do you know why we have the drink, gin and tonic? Because the British Army was stationed all through India and Pakistan, what we now call India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Africa. And so many of the troops were getting malaria. In fact, everywhere in the world where there's malaria, more troops die of malaria than from conflict. So many troops were getting malaria that they wanted to find some sort of treatment and they found that the uh, bark of this tree made uh, quinine, and it, but it's very, very bitter. And you have to take a substantial dose every day for the sporozoites not to uh, be able to get into the liver. And so uh, to get the men to drink their quinine water, they offered them a shot of tonic. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, with their shot, uh, with their tonic, they offered them a shot of gin. And so, gin and tonic was created to make soldiers drink their quinine water. So, interesting little side bit of history. Quinine is one of the few things that still works, but you have to get a large amount of it, and it can't be fake quinine, like a lot we buy is not natural quinine. Yeah? So, does that work in the Thailand and Cambodia? Yes. Still works a little bit there, but it's you know you have to get a huge amount every day. All right, then we had chloroquine and a few other compounds that would prevent the uh, parasites in the blood. Uh, we killed them in the blood, but because we gave them in small quantities, or the people that took it quit taking it when they feel better instead of taking it until they run through the whole dosage. Um, these drugs are now uh, most parasites are immune to them. So what do we do? Well, we've got again, like we did before, get rid of the vector or release um, sterile mosquitoes or something like that or develop a pesticide that isn't so damaging or a fungi that will kill the, just that mosquito, all of which will be disastrous and we just don't really know what to do. So what do we have? The choices are prevention and a vaccine. So the problem is you're going to have to make three vaccines. You've got to make an anti-sporozoite vaccine, an anti-merozoite vaccine, and an anti-gametocyte vaccine. At least two of those three you have to make. And each one of those life cycles of the parasite has different proteins on its outer surface. So they have effectively made an anti-sporozoite vaccine. They made an anti-merozoite that they found out the adjuvant, that's what carries it. Uh, you know, every vaccine has something that keeps the protein in one spot, so your body's immune system uh, responds to it. The adjuvant was carcinogenic. So they have a new merozoite vaccine that they're trying in um, Zambia and um, Kenya right now, and it's 30% effective. So if they mix it with the vaccine they already have, the sporozoite, they believe that they might have a vaccine that might be somewhere around 50% effective. Not great, but better than what we have now. 15 or 50? 50, if they mix the two together. But there's a lot of research done on it, like uh, trying to develop a mosquito that can't carry it and have it replace the anopheles that carries it. There's a lot of work being done on it. And remember, a sickle cell 
is an inherited trait because the malaria parasite can't live in sickled cells. Um, so what do we do now? Well, there have been two drugs made to prevent malaria. Uh, one's malarone, and I forgot what the other one was. One is made in England, and one is made in the United States. And if you go to parts of the world where they have malaria, you have to take this drug, and by the way, it's $3 a day. You have to take it every day for two weeks before you go, the whole time you're there, and two weeks after you come back. And even if you're bitten, you won't get the parasite. Which is really good, but rather expensive for just going on a visit. And there is one bad thing. The one that is made in this country, and by the way, supplied and made, all of our troops have to take it, causes hallucinations in 20% of the people that take it. Don't you want a man carrying in a gun with a hallucination? The variety that they sell in England and is now available here in the United States and they are removing the malarone that we sell here, it does not have that side effect and the U.S. government is now converting uh, all soldiers to the variety made in England. I forgot what the exact brand name was. But if you do travel and you set up with a travel agency and you go and get your yellow fever vaccine and the other things, uh, they will give you uh, a prescription for the medication and that you can take. And this is really what we've got because treating after you got it is just not working well. And the vaccine is still years away. That's why Mr. Jonas is so big. Yeah. Problems in my cherries. All right. Only two more. Woo! You'll be out of here before nine. All right. So the last two is are again, remember plasmodial is protist, and trypanosomes and leishmania, leishmania are all protist diseases. Uh, this is trypanosomiasis, and it's both African and American varieties. And who remembers why with many of these diseases have an African and an American variety? Millions of slaves were brought here from Africa with their parasites, and their parasites would die because their other host, their alternate host, or their definitive host wasn't here, so they had to adapt to the Western Hemisphere. So that's why you have uh, similar parasites uh, in, that originated in Africa and now have sort of um, developed a new variety here in Western Hemisphere. So the worst test question, the worst of all the eukaryotic parasites, the most hopeless of all, is African sleeping sickness, or African trypanosomiasis. Uh, it comes in two varieties, uh, Rusia and Rhodesia. And only two animals on Earth get this disease and die from it. Cows and people. Haven't we heard this before? Cows and people, we seem to be really connected with their diseases and their they with ours. Now here's something really nice and exciting. Veterinarians have spent more money on treating cows than people have spent on treating people. So there are effective treatments that are cheap and without side effects for cows, but not for people. All right, um, and with the two varieties, the Rhodesi, is the one that's usually in cows, and the brusei is the one that's usually in people, but either one can get either one. So it's not really important that you know that. Um, let's talk about it. One, there is no definitive host. Several times in what I would call ancient literature in the 1900s, some scientists, parasit parasitologists, have reported that they saw a definitive host but no one has ever seen a vicinity form in modern history, so we consider this disease to be only asexual in reproduction. Uh, you can diagnose it. How about that? In five, 60 seconds, I can teach you how to diagnose this disease. All you have to do is take a finger uh, stab, just like they do for uh, testing blood on a diabetic, and put a good-sized drop on a clean slot. 
Pick another slide, lower it, and drag it just like you did on the negative stain. Let it air dry, add oil, and look at it under oil, and if you see this little serpent snake-like thing among the red blood cells, that's the parasite, the triparasite. And it's carried by the biting tetsy fly, and it's in what they call the Great Savannah Belt of Africa. These are the huge grasslands. Remember, Africa is the richest continent on Earth. Uh, if we didn't have the disease, remember, if we wiped out the parasitic diseases in Africa, 67% of all disease on Earth would be gone. And Africa would be, those people would be billionaires because there is just hundreds and hundreds of square miles of grassland for cows and sheep and goats and stuff like that. But because of the parasites, they're trapped in this cycle. Uh, let's see, 60 million people are at risk for trypanosomiasis. Uh, let's talk about the bad news about it. The tetsy fly was almost wiped out. It's a huge biting fly. When it bites you, you know it. It's like a horse fly. Anyone ever been bitten by a horse fly? Not pretty. It hurts. That thing lands on you. If you don't notice, it's like somebody stuck an ice pick in you. Anyway, it's a biting fly. It can do like 60 times its weight in blood. It's outrageous. It can, you'll see in the little video we're going to see, you can watch one go from nothing to about this big in just 10 or 15 seconds. Um, we almost wiped it out when we were spraying 2,4-D. Now it's immune to every known pesticide. So it is everywhere, and if you get bitten once, you get the disease. It takes three years to kill you, so you get to live through it. You know you're going to die. It's 100% fatal. Uh, what happens is the parasite gets in the blood and eventually, it will eventually cross the blood-brain barrier. And it's waste that it gives off is a chemical that depresses the reptilian or lower brain that causes breathing and consciousness. And so, you basically go into a coma because of this poison exuded by this parasite once it crosses the blood-brain barrier. So once you have it in your bloodstream, it takes about two years to cross the blood-brain barrier, and that's when you start getting to where you kind of, instead, of, you can't stay conscious. You, If anybody doesn't stimulate you, you will fall asleep, and you will quit breathing. You won't eat. And that's why they call it, they miss, you know, misguess that this is sleeping. It's actually a comatose state. Um, what else did I want to say about it? Of course, it's the adult trypanosome that enters the fluid around the brain and spinal cord that causes. How does it hide? That's why. This is why it's so dangerous. It hides by changing its surface protein every seven days. It takes 10 to 14 to make antibodies. So by the time your body makes antibodies to it, they're already changed and don't work. Um, why is it so horrible? Because every wild animal carries it, but only two get sick, people and cows. So to get rid of it, you'd have to kill every wild ana animal in Africa, which ain't going to happen. So. It is the worst of our diseases. Um, now, let's talk about treatment. There are two treatments. One that is easy, one shot, no side effects, and you're cured. Except it's not available. It's called DSMO. It was originally um, manufactured as a potential cancer treatment. It didn't work for cancer. It works perfectly for African sleeping sickness. And it was made by Aventis Corporation. It is a very difficult chemical to make. It destroys equipment when you make it because it is extremely caustic. So it's very expensive to make and one dose costs $600. But it will cure African sleeping sleeping sickness with one dose. Problem? There's no profit. P. 
people that get it can't afford it. So the company quit making it. It's now made in the United States in the name of the product Veniqua, which is something of, it's like a travel size of toothpaste, and it's to get rid of whiskers on women. My grandma has more of a mustache than I do, and she uses it. It's Veniqua. And uh, they do make it for that, and they make a huge profit. Each little tube is 50 bucks, and it removes, it prevents a facial hair in women. Uh, but they don't make it for people that are dying of 100% fatal disease in Africa. Um, what they do use is Molossoprol. And Molossoprol is arsenic plus the same ingredient used to preserve antifreeze in car engines. Uh, it is about the thickness of honey and you have to give 20 mils once a day for 10 days. It feels like somebody is pouring fire into your blood vessels, so you have to tie the people down to give them the medication. You can't just say stand there and take it because they'll scream and fight you. You have to tie them down. The plastic syringe melts every time you use it, so you can't use the syringe more than once, and it destroys the blood vessel you inject it in. And it kills from 12 to 20 percent of the people you give it to. If they survive the treatment, and remember they got to have it every day for 10 days, then it will kill the parasite and they won't get, they won't die of African sleeping sickness, but if they get bitten by one tetsi fly, two years later, they got to go through it again. Yeah? No. No, it's just because of the, uh, you know, the acidity in one of the steps. Well, interestingly enough, uh, the best, anybody know what the best charity in the world for helping the poor and the disadvantaged is? The one that helps more people than anybody for the least amount of uh, money. They have virtually no overhead whatsoever. Uh, they are the most respected agency in the world for assistance in disasters and for help. Doctors Without Borders, it's a French agency. Doctors Without Borders has been working on this for years and they've been going to the pharmaceutical companies and saying, you know, why don't you make this? And trying to embarrass them into doing what's right. And the, pharmaceutical companies say, why don't you get the government to pay for it? And we're not a charity. And so then they tried to convince governments to give the pharmaceutical companies tax breaks to make enough until they could find another solution. And they didn't. So guess what the pharmaceutical company Aventus did? They went on television, they pulled what we now call the Bush procedure. If you remember about 10 years ago, George Bush the Dumber announced to the world that he was going to give $40 million a year to Africa to prevent the spread of HIV AIDS. Remember that big announcement? And the whole world went, oh my God, he's a conservative and he's going to do this and he's going to save hundreds of thousands of people in Africa. And then he just didn't do it. That's the new game in politics. Everybody gets angry, everybody gets upset, so some big politician makes a grand gesture and no one checks to make sure they follow through. So, when Doctors Without Orders made this big stink about PSMO, Adventists announced that they were going to give a seven-year supply, they were gonna make a seven-year supply for all of Sub-Saharan Africa until they could begin, someone else could begin producing it, and they would give the patent to the World Health Organization to then bid it out and make the product. What do you think happened? Nothing. They gave the patent, but WHO doesn't have any factories nor any money 
And did they actually manufacture it to give for seven years? No, they never have. But everybody forgot about it because of what he's making this thing. So, you know, it's a really sad thing. Uh, so hopefully this is about five minute interview on it. And you'll see that. And then we'll go to the last three. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Sometimes these don't. that a large portion of the population of Africa is wiped out by well. AIDS. But while that possibility has caught the attention of the world, another equally frightening disease, sleeping sickness, has virtually gone unnoticed, except by the American doctor you're about to meet. <laughs> For the last seven years, Dr. Mickey Richard, a pediatrician from Colorado, has been fighting a lonely battle in one of the most remote corners of Africa to try to stop a terrifying and painful disease from decimating this war-torn province of southern Sudan. <laughs> Today, Dr. Richard and her team from the International Medical Corps are trying to put up a firewall against a disease called sleeping sickness. It's spread by the bite of a testy fly, and 40 years ago it was almost totally wiped out. But now, because of decades of civil war and neglect, a frightful epidemic has re-emerged threatening millions of people. In some parts of Africa, the disease is killing as many people as AIDS. The difference is, there is a cure for sleeping sickness. It is a disease that's 100% fatal if not treated. It's a disease that's almost 100% curable if treated. So when you, that's a dichotomy, huh? A fatal disease and yet we have a cure for it, so why aren't we trying to cure the people that have it? Because we don't have the resources. Do they know what's going on? I mean, are they aware of the, of, of the sleeping sickness? Oh yes, very much so. Uh, most of the kids here have had at least one family member die of sleeping sickness. A mother, a father. I never done! No one wants to hear done. his or her name called today because it means their blood shows the first signs of the disease. Those infected with the deadly parasite are taken to Dr. Richard's remote field hospital where there's no power, no running water, and just old-fashioned cures. The only thing not in short supply are patients, and many of them have had to walk for days just to get here, including children slipping into a deep sleep from which they may never awake. Does it, does it make you mad? You don't have any feelings. Uh, uh, a little trouble. How bad is John? Well, now we do that thing, we've got the parasol, so we have found the parasol in the fluid that surrounds the brain, and that means what is how you're going to progress now. That means he's got a very advanced disease. He's very, very sleepy, he sleeps all the day, uh, he's having a lot of difficulty with walking, he's not talking a little bit, he's a little bit confused. Uh, he is, and he is. Yeah, he will fall asleep right here, we let him. And in a worst case scenario, how long do you have to live? Well, if we don't treat him at all, he is 100% fatal. So if we don't treat him, he will die. The main drug that's used to treat the advanced form of sleeping sickness is an antiquated old substance that was first developed 15 years ago. It's called minocicrol, and it's made up of arsenic mixed with the compound that goes into making antifreeze for cars. It actually kills about 5% of the people who use it. And the patients who do survive the injection say that it feels like hot chili peppers coursing through their veins. <laughs> you will see adult men here crying once it's being injected in their veins. Uh, I mean, in, we're talking still a population. <laughs> this drug is so painful. And it can kill a, a huge number of the patients. In the West, in the United States, would a vet even give this drug to a dog? Um, probably not. 
There are better drugs to treat animals than there are humans. You're kidding. I'm not kidding. Uh, and yes, veterinarians have put the money into research so the drugs that are used in animal trypanosomiasis are actually somewhat better than the ones that are used in human trypanosomiasis. That's the scientific name for sleeping sickness. I know this for the doctors, they don't prepare a whole load of syringes. Why not? Right. The syringes we use here are plastic, uh, uh, and so the drug is so caustic, the preservative is so caustic, it causes the plastic of the syringe to melt. If it causes a hard plastic syringe to melt, what does it do to, to somebody's vein? Well, it destroys the vein. Most of the time the vein can't be used again. And what that means is that each shot is more of an ordeal, especially for children like Zena, as well as the doctors who struggle to find enough healthy veins to last the 10-day course of painful injections. I know you're a pediatrician and you saw these children in your life and you used to hear kids scream on injections, but this is different, this isn't just a needle stick. This is like burning their body. Yeah. And just like when you're saying, Mommy, Mommy, why are you hurting me? I mean, you know, that's kind of heart-wrenching. Huh? Yeah. This melastrophal is just so bad. I mean, how do you justify using it, even? We use it because otherwise people would die. So even though you might die from the drug 5 to 10 percent of the time, you would die from the disease 100 percent of the time. So your chances, it's like rushing the left, what do you want, huh? It doesn't have to be this way. In fact, scientists in the United States and Europe already have found a far less painful way to cure sleeping sickness. Only the people here will probably never see it. If it's for the drug companies, it's just not profitable. You can't make money making medicines for people who earn less than a dollar a day. He's definitely reacting to the combination medicine. The drug is called GSMO. It cures sleeping sickness without toxic side effects. Dr. Richard took us to this old warehouse, which has the only local stock of GSMO. It was left behind by another group of aid workers who fled the fighting here 10 years ago. Just be careful, there's a lot of broken glass, huh? The FMO was meant to cure cancer and make a fortune for the pharmaceutical company. But it failed as a cancer drug, and so even though it did cure human sickness, production was stopped. And now, the DSMO lying around here is expired and useless. This is uh, a violent DSMO. So this is the, the miracle drug that could actually be used. Right. We don't use this because it's outdated. Um, but this is the very same thing. And even though this is successful on um, advanced stage sleeping sickness, the company is not making it anymore. Right, the company no longer makes it. The process, the chemical process to make it is very complicated and it does destroy machinery, so it's very expensive. At $600 a patient, DSMO is just too expensive for the sleeping sickness victims here in Africa. But DSMO will be available in another formulation for consumers in the West. Would you dare that someone get this it turns out the drug helps remove facial hair. And this commercial is part of a campaign to launch a new hair removal cream for women. It's made by Bristol Myers Squibb. Now, how close is that to you? If uh, an existing drug is going to be used and produced and, 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 and sold um, at a very high return on investment uh, for a lifestyle disease, uh, and it's not available, uh, for a disease that threatens the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. I, I don't know any other word uh, to describe that situation than you don't see it. James Robinski from Médecins Sans Frontières, or Doctors Without Borders, is trying to force the pharmaceutical industry to pay attention to what he calls the neglected diseases of the third world. How do you convince that multi-billion dollar empire? to devote a tiny, tiny percentage to these medicines that can cure these diseases? Well, you can ask. <laughs> and the answer that uh, you would like to get uh, is that 
uh, the pharmaceutical industry is not a social service. The pharmaceutical industry is a business, uh, and they will behave as any business does. Uh, it will seek to maximize its profit. And we certainly don't want to be uh, seen as anti-humanitarian. Uh, and so we've seen you know, piecemeal sort of efforts like uh, the drug donation programs and uh, price reductions and things of like that sort. But in reality, what they, what they actually achieve uh, in the developing world is very, very little. Well, Aventis, the company that originally developed DSMO, did give the formula to the World Health Organization before the stocks ran out. But it hasn't been easy to find a high-quality manufacturer who's willing to make the drug. Harvey Bale, a spokesman for pharmaceutical companies, defended the industry's efforts. I think we have a very serious problem today. The bulk of the pharmaceutical industry is in the so-called north part of the world. And the problems of disease and infectious diseases are in the south. And many of the people in the south simply do not have the means to buy these medicines. So where do they turn? They turn to the pharmaceutical industry and say, please, you solve the problem of access. Because we're a lot easier to attack than our own governments. We simply tend to shut them off and tell them to go away. But you're the ones who actually produce or could produce the life-saving drugs. We are the ones who do produce the life-saving drugs. But not for all these diseases and not in affordable quantities. We recognize that. And I think the industry is working on that. But the problem is, again, the poor of the world, the third world, is looking for the pharmaceutical industry not only to discover and produce the new drugs, but to somehow give them away and say that uh, the responsibility of governments should be forgotten and it should all rest on the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, Harvey Bell, who represents the pharmaceutical industry, basically he says, hang on a second, we're not a charitable organization. Why do you expect us to donate our expertise or our drugs? Medicines are not CDs. You know, medicines are not uh, you know, uh, Gucci purses or whatever, Gucci watches. Medicines are, are life-saving entities. It's not for Africans to justify their existence. They're human beings. At the end of our stay with Dr. Richard, another young woman was carried into the hospital deep in a sleeping sickness coma. If Dr. Richer had some DSMO, she told us she could probably save her life. Today is the night sixty day, the bad day, the fact that we had a relapse kids come in uh, that if we had the appropriate medicine for her, I could treat her. So it makes you feel kind of depressed and sad today. Uh, usually we're pretty upbeat here, but uh, just a little down today. Since we left Dr. Richard's hospital in southern Sudan, her son has run out and she'll soon be unable to treat any more patients. But after intense pressure from international aid agencies and the media, the drug companies concerned are planning to announce that they'll donate a three-year supply of DSMO. However, the group Doctors Without Borders says there is still no long-term commitment to producing what's known as the miracle cure for sleeping sickness. Okay, so back, that's the sad story of sleeping sickness, the worst and most hopeless of our diseases. Who called us there in the country? Say what now? Aventus. Aventus Pasteur. Oh, how come she couldn't give her her expired medication? I mean... If it was me, I would. Yeah. But, you know, there's all the... They have to be incredibly careful. They're not citizens of these countries. And should something go wrong, you know, the lawsuits and it will fall on everybody's head. Well, all right, I so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, the next one is American trypanosomiasis. It's called Chagas disease. It actually affects you because Los Angeles is one of the few places in the United States where the blood banks test for Chagas. And, of course, the reason is of our immigration pattern. Uh, these are the countries that have Africa, American trypanosomiasis or Chagas disease. Uh, it's carried by this ravitted bug. It's a biting bug that's in the um, grass. And uh, this is, here's a test question. Which of the diseases does the bite of the bug not actually infect you? And this is it. 
when the bug bites you, it injects enzymes.